All righty then. <laughs> Welcome, 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 welcome 300 times to the episode 300 special of the Wild Business Growth Podcast. This intro is exactly 300 words and 300 characters and 300 breaths. I'm sorry. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, and this is your place uh, typically to hear a new entrepreneur every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. And for this episode 300 special, you're going to hear many, many wild entrepreneurs from the previous 99 episodes, including returning wild entrepreneurs, fan favorite snippets from the past 99, and some bloopers that range from weird voices to voice cracks and everything in between and outside of that. Before we kick off, I just want to extend the warmest, wildest thank you to all you wild listeners out there for making this all possible. Uh, 300 is like a serious pinch me moment and feels like we just got started and (laughs) this first episode was in August 2018 and this podcast would not be possible without your support. Some cool things that have taken place over the past 100 episodes. We've interviewed more and more guests from around the world than ever before and we've featured more wild listener questions, questions that you've sent in and submitted that I actually asked to the guests than ever before. We finally got on the wild bandwagon and launched full video episodes on YouTube. And we launched the podcasting to the max newsletter. So just throw, throwing all sorts of things at you. And I think we've set a record for, for amount of puns in each episode as well. Also within this time frame, I hit a major goal of speaking at podcast movement, still blown away by the, the turnout and, and everything there. And not to mention, uh, Dan and I got married <laughs> over the past couple of years. So uh, that, that makes it seem like we did it multiple times. Over the course of the past 100 episodes, Dan and I got married. And we did our honeymoon to Italy. Uh, we did another awesome international trip to Spain and Portugal. All in all, it's been an absolutely incredible 100 episodes, a couple of years. And I absolutely love doing this podcast. I absolutely am endlessly fascinated. Those are weird words to string together like that, but I'm absolutely endlessly fascinated by connecting with so many amazing wild entrepreneurs around the world, hearing how they turn their business ideas into actual businesses, how they've grown their businesses. Uh, I still can't believe this is like a thing that's taken on a life of its own. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope you enjoy tuning in as much as I do creating it. Speaking of creating it, Shout out my guy, Jeff Kozlowski, who has been a huge and huge help with Max Podcasting and has been a huge help in making the video versions possible for the Wild Business Growth Podcast as well. Without further ado, let's get to the first batch we got coming up here. We have a interview with returning guest Thor Peterson, who, if you remember, traveled all the way around the world, <laughs> every country in the world, without taking a single flight. Then we have a fan favorite segment with Melinda Emerson, who talks where to keep your focus as a small business owner. And finally, an incredibly weird uh, and spectacular voice from Jamie Mons. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are back, 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 but back, back, back with a very, very special returning guest for episode 300 of Wild Business Growth Podcast, Thor Peterson, uh, who just like everyone else I've interviewed has been around the world without a single flight. Thor, (laughs) thank you so much for coming back on. When we did the full interview, uh, your episode, which again, one of the all-time favorites, it was episode 256, uh, October 2023. And here we are almost a year later, and uh, I think you're still traveling. How you doing, Thor? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. And first of all, congratulations. 300 episodes, man. That's a major milestone. You must be so happy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm exhausted. I've just been traveling from container ship to container ship now. No, that, but <laughs> no, it means a lot. It's uh, really, really cool and special and, and extra cool to reconnect with awesome people like yourself. Oh, thank you. You know, back on 
the interview with you, like we had some amazing questions from wild listeners. Like I was blown away by how many people submitted questions for you and um, so many great questions, everything about, you know, favorite food to what country was the scariest to, you know, how did you like manage to pay for all this <laughs> crazy travels that you did? But I just wanted to check in, like, has your perspective on travel changed at all, you know, almost a year after you return home or over a year after? Well, I, I don't know. I don't think it has really changed, but I'm enjoying traveling so much more now that the overall project is over because something that most people miss is that I was caught within some really strict rules within that project. And uh, I felt that I had some self-imposed uh, shackles on, you know, caught within my own ambition. So when I finally did return back to Denmark, I was free. And now I travel wherever I want, whenever I want, and I stay as long as I want. You know, it's, it's a completely different way to travel. And I really enjoy that. And do you go on flights now? I, I do, but I oh actually... Oh my God, who, who am I talking to? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I try to weigh out if it makes sense to go with a flight or not. Like I'm I'm a part of the extraordinary travel festival in Bangkok this year, so I will be flying to Bangkok. But I was invited to go and meet the Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross, the IFRC, in Geneva, and I went by train, even though that <laughs> was kind of long by train. <laughs> Um, I do a lot of motorcycling these days and kayaking and running. So I'm still underground. Well, Bangkok, that's, that's a good one. That one probably now that you have the option again, makes more sense to fly to versus like a three month, uh, extravaganza on water to get there or however you would get well, there. I'll tell you what though, I am looking into riding a motorcycle from Denmark to Hong Kong. So, uh, but that's probably next year. <laughs> not a bother. You could just probably do it this weekend. Why not? No, that, yeah, sure. Awesome. Well, excited to keep in touch with that adventure too. You know, you mentioned that you've been doing some speaking, like I've been following you on social media and it's just amazing, like the appearances you've made and uh, what you've done since then. How often are you doing like speaking or, you know, public appearances these days since, since you completed your saga? Uh, I guess I do probably average about two speaking gigs a month. I've been on a speaking tour in the early months of this year. And then over the summer, I'm kind of on a break from the tour. And then uh, come October, November, I'm on the tour again. And that's exclusively in Denmark and it's in Danish. And then corporates and organizations, they reach out and ask me to come. Some of them have been in Denmark. Some of them have been abroad. It's It's been really cool. It has. And I think you're even before you started this whole travel journey like you're an interesting guy like anybody would have a great conversation with you and now on top of that people probably have millions and millions and millions of questions for you uh and and travel recos like we my wife dana and i just from like the trips that we do always get hit up for trip recos i can only imagine the outpour you get from like <laughs> oh my god like bangkok <laughs> overall though i'm curious what what is the most common question that you get from people about your journey well, I mean, it's it, it depends a little bit because it, it becomes quite topical. Um, these days, a lot of people are asking about what my visit was like in Ukraine or what I think about Russia. Um, I still get the, why did you do it? <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I, I actually think the most interesting question that I get, uh, because I can't really answer, the most common question is, how come I never gave up? Like, what was the source that kept me going for all of those years and i don't i do not have a good answer for it <laughs> i really don't know where it came from <laughs> yeah so you're always like that is an amazing question i will get back to you <laughs> <laughs> no at, at this point i have different answers for it but i know that all the answers i give are not the answer like i'm still searching for the answer well thor so awesome to catch up you are you are uh my travel spirit animal. So th thanks for all you do and, and sharing your lessons and journeys and stories with everybody. Um, I know if people want to to learn more about your journey and everything about the big journey, but also maybe about this motorcycle journey coming up, Instagram is once upon a saga. And then your website is Thor Peterson. That's Peterson ending in S E N dot D K. Last thing, just one single random travel tip, a one liner. It could be literally about anything as small as you want. Send us home, Thor. Okay, you should always bring a pen 
because you need to fill out forms all the time and you're always asking for a pen. Plus you meet people and you want to write down their address or their email address or details. So you want to draw something for someone. So bring a pen. You're not going to be able to hire people and train people if you don't have a documented system. How will they know how your t-shirt goes in the box with the tissue paper and two pieces of candy and the sticker over top of the tissue paper to go in the, in the shipping? How do your shipping labels look on the outside of your packages? Nobody will know that if it's in your head, right? You got to document it. You got to write it down. And it's painful to do, especially if you've been winging it every day but that it doesn't work like that i promise you when you get hired at old navy they show you how to fold the shirts to make them look nice neat in the stack how do they fold the shirts at your business right <laughs> like where where's your training where's your tool i mean a lot of the biggest mistake that i see business owners make is they hire people and they basically throw them the keys and say good luck there's no onboarding there's not a lot of training we expect people to perform at a high level with no training, which is madness, right? You know, so you need to make sure that you, even your interns, what is it that you want them to do? What are their deliverables? What are their, what is their execution steps, right? You know, so you want to make sure that you have processes and systems to take work off of you. <laughs> like, like the reason why you want to document stuff is because as the business owner, you need to be focused on your most high valued activities. And let me tell you, your most high valued activity is customer acquisition and customer retention. That's it. That's what you need to be spending your time doing. The rest of this stuff is minutia and you need to hire some people to handle minutia, right? But your job is to get customers and keep customers. That's your job as a business owner. And I also make this other weird noise through my mouth. I don't know if, do you want me to make the noise? I, I, I do. You shouldn't have brought that up. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here it goes. Talking about awkward. That Can you amazing. hear it very well? I don't know what that was, but yes, I, I don't know if I have dreams or nightmares about that, but that's, that's great. <laughs> Uh, that, that's awesome. I, Wait, what do you call that? <laughs> I don't even know what that's called. I, I don't know. But yeah, I do that to my kids at night when they're not behaving, scare them a little bit. Holy cow. All right. Next we have returning guest Shauna Game from Everyone's Talking Money. We have a look back at how the original Theragun uh, for Therabody was created by Dr. Jason Worsland. And a little bit of whistling while you work if you will, from Dr. Brian Suterer. Alrighty, we are back, back, back for a very, very special episode 300 wild interview with Shauna Game of Everyone's Talking Money. Uh, and, and everyone's talking about this, you know, five minute interview already. I can just feel it. But Shauna, so excited to have you back. Thank you so much for making time out of your busy book writing process uh, to do this. How in the world are you doing today? <laughs> today, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, I look forward to any time I get to talk to you and hear some corny jokes and uh, put, it puts a smile on my face. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, that's what I'm here for. I usually just put frowns on people's faces. So this is a, a, a nice change of pace for me as well. But um, I, I was looking back, you know, as, as prep for this, uh, you know, talking to the award winning host you are, I listened back to the interview, like the full interview you did on Wild Business Growth. And so this was episode 270 back in January of 2024. Of course, awesome interview and like awesome to reconnect after we met at Podcast Movement originally. But it was really cool listening back because like I listened to some of the the lessons that you shared in that episode. And I'm like, wow, I like I really applied some of Shauna's lessons from that. Um, one about like being smart about, you know, planning ahead for your travels and making sure that, you know, you can swing big travel like we've since have done and come back from our Spain and Portugal trip, which was awesome. And we didn't stress about the budget too much like you talked about, but we also, you know, we used travel credit card to our advantage. We uh, made sure that like, you know, we planned everything out well in advance and we worked it into like our planning for the year of like, all right, we're going to make this trip happen. And I think the other lesson that I really took away from what you talked about was like managing your, your relationship with money and, and 
managing your stress levels as it's tied to it. And I, I think that's never been more important uh, as an entrepreneur. So, so I just wanted to invite you back on to say thank you <laughs> because clearly I've, <laughs> I've taken a lot of it from that. But I, I, I think the, the lessons on, on, on money and, and stress and travel like, like never get old. Yeah, you know, I, I talk about obviously relationship with money and stress and anxiety and fear around money. And sometimes it makes people's head tilt a little bit because it's a, a different way that they've even thought about money, even though they know this exists for them. And so, you know, we just, if you can look at the stats, I mean, let alone entrepreneurs, the amount of money stress that people feel, it's, you know, an exorbitant amount and it's only getting worse and worse. So, you know, I love that you took some of these tips and were like, oh yeah, these actually, these actually work. I'm actually going <laughs> to uh, apply these because I think that we don't realize that so much of our relationship with money is felt internally inside of us. And so, you know, if we can work on that practice and just at least have some sort of understanding of, of what's going on inside of us, then we can work on creating the outside changes with money that we really want to make. And recently you, you've not only have, you know, your relationship with money, but you have your relationship with uh, writing a book, which I'm sure is, you know, equally, if not even more stressful. So first of all, congrats uh, on like everything and how far you've gotten on it so far. I know that this is your, your first ever book that you've written, and I'm sure it's been a long time coming and really excited for it to come out. But before that happens, I know you need to finish it up. <laughs> and I, know that, I know that there's a lot of pieces in the process, but for anybody out there who, who aspires to write a book one day, which is kind of funny because it's always like on the, uh, Maslow's hierarchy when they talk about self-actualization, the example they're always like, writing a book, writing a novel, whatever. What's um, a tip you can share for anybody to finally get over the hump and finally like write a book and, and, and heading towards getting it out there into the world? I think the biggest tip I have is to write the book that you want to write. When you're out pitching your book and you're trying to get agents and publishers, so many of them will try to tweak your message to fit in their agenda. And there is always a publisher out there. You may have to just search a little bit, but there's a publisher who will allow you to write the book you want to write. Not to say that, you know, it doesn't need to be edited and concise and all of that, but I think really staying true to your expertise, your story, what you want to share and not tweaking that too much to fit under somebody else's agenda. Overall, do you think there's been more editing work for your book or your catalog of 1200 podcast episodes. <laughs> <laughs> really? I was stunned when I got the book notes back from the copy editor and she was like, you know, it's pretty much just grammatical things. Like you wrote a really tight book. And I was like, all right, you know, I, I feel pretty good about that. So I would say definitely the podcast 1200 episodes is, uh, you know, taking a lot more editing expertise, shockingly. So <laughs> I, I just have to say that, you know, episode 300, I, I'm honored to get to like a quarter of the catalog <laughs> that you have. Um, do, do you have any advice out there for anybody to keep going and get to like the hundreds or even past a thousand episodes? Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty crazy. I'm almost 10 years in um, <laughs> you know, doing this podcast. And sometimes I think like, should I continue? Should I do a new podcast? Like it's, you know, I'm constantly having that thought, but I think you know, the more episodes you do, the better you get, the tighter your show gets. And for me, it probably just like yourself, you talk to more and more interesting people and you start to have this like collection of friends and um, almost like a black book that you can call upon, you know, when you need different things. And so I think, you know, there's so much power in podcasting and just continuing to do the thing helps you get better and better. And you know, it's such a different world of podcasting than when I started in 2015. But I think more than ever, there's a great place for like an independent podcaster who's got a, a, a business or a book or, you know, something that they want to entrepreneurial get out into the world. The podcast is like such a great stage to bring that all to life. Just keep doing it. Well, I, I've listened to all 1200 of your episodes and uh... <laughs> I, I think you've gotten oh, worse tell with me each you episode. Haven't. It gets worse and worse, and it's it's just terrible. And I don't know why. You, no, no, no. I it, it's really one of those skills. That it, it's spot on. Like the more you do it, you get better and better at it. And I guess us meeting is like an example of this. Of like 
how much it improves just overall your communication skills like in life as well in, in the real world not just the podcast world but um you're absolutely like a an inspiration and a, and a master class and everything in this space and beyond so last thing so to wrap up here in the original episode where you were the guest um i don't know why i said it like that that sounded really weird but i'm gonna keep that in <laughs> We wrapped up with asking you for some Asheville recos. And since those recos, where you recommended going to Baby Bowl for burgers in Asheville, my, my wife Dana and I, as well as my brother and Andrew, my, my brother and Andrew, my brother Andrew, we went to Asheville a few months after that. And actually, Dana and I, our last day, got a burger at Baby Bowl, which was fantastic. It was as good as you were saying. I'm just going to trouble you for what is one more Asheville food reco that is like a must do or must eat spot in Ash Vegas, as they say. <laughs> I mean, if you have kids, it's probably like picking your favorite kid because there are <laughs> so many amazing restaurants here. It is absolutely insane. I would say Chai Pani if you if you love uh, interesting Indian food and um, something that will just like leave your taste buds thirsting for more that would definitely be one of those on the top of my list perfect uh i i and i'm not even going to say the name because i will mess it up shauna thank you so much i know that you can learn more at everyone's talking money.com at the time of this recording you know you're, you're putting the finishing touches on the book but can you share when will the book come out and uh, like when, when should people expect that and if there's a place to to check for that my book is called Unraveling Your Relationship with Money, and it will be out in February. So I will be shouting from the rooftops <laughs> everywhere I can uh, to try and get that book in as many people's hands, because I think it's really a resource that's going to help so many people. And you can continue to follow me on the podcast, Everyone's Talking Money, or on my website, everyonestalkingmoney.com, and there'll be all the latest there, I promise. Perfect. Well, super excited for it. Thanks so much, Shauna. And um, I'm going to hit you up for a third Asheville food reco soon. So we'll talk soon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what if I had something that bounced back and forth and then I was like, oh my God, I can make that. So I went to my garage and I grabbed a jigsaw. I brought the jigsaw in. I had a long blade on it and I bent the blade, just rolled the blade down, wrapped a dish towel around it, made a little ball. And then I wrapped an electrical tape around the dish towel. So now I'm using this thing and I'm against my body and now it's doing what I wanted it to do. It's like, it's coming up and down off the body. The jigsaw that I had at the time had a dial on the top. There was a speed dial. So I, I was just experimenting with the speed. So I'm back and forth and I'm watching what's going on. And as I'm doing this, I make note that my pain is not coming back. So that, that first experience, I was like, wait a minute, what happened? Like, this is really doing what I'm thinking it's going to do. So I set it down and I just kind of let the pain come back because it always did. I'm in such inflammation. I grabbed the ther that, that machine again, and I just started using it on my body. And I thought I'd have to go right in the area where the pain was. So I, I, I'd hold, try and hold it up there. And then I just kind of came down on my arm and then I put on my legs. And I realized as long as I had that on my body, moving it around at a certain speed, I could tolerate the pain. Like I could breathe. I could eat and it would give me these windows of opportunity. It'd give me like eight to 10, 12 minutes where the pain wasn't so bad. If I got up and had to shower or make some breakfast or something like I could do that without being in such pain. So I just started experimenting and then I just realized like, holy crap, this thing is like working. And there had to be something like this in the world, you know, like there's no way I'm the first one that thought of this. I'm really good at whistling. Oh, yeah. Can, can you give us an example? Like a two-second yeah. whistle. <laughs> oh, man, you're going to put me on the spot. I feel like it's going to mess up your microphone. There we go. <laughs> Maybe it's just because my wife can't whistle, so I feel like I can whistle really well. <laughs> All right, next up we have returning guest Robert Forto, the wildly fantastic entrepreneur from Alaska. We have a look back at the early days and versatility of The Onion from founder Scott Dickers. And we have a custom song from Tamara and Sean, but Tamara in this one, Termin. Alrighty, we are 
back, 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 as Chris Berman, Boomer says, <laughs> to episode 300 of the Wild Business Growth Podcast with the very, very special Robert Forto, dog musher, as well as founder of Alaska Dog Works, First Paw Media, some other exciting stuff that we'll talk about in a bit. But Robert, so excited to have you back on. Uh, I, I stand by my claim that you are one of the most interesting men and people in the world. Thank you so much for joining. How are you doing today? I am great, Max. Thanks for having me on and congrats on the milestone episode. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm just trying to to chase uh, you and your your sled dogs. So you're good good inspiration here. But um no, super exciting. And I was looking back and prep for this, I listened back to your original interview on the show. And so you were episode 253 back in September of 2023. Uh just about a month after we actually met at Podcast Movement in Denver, which was an awesome, awesome time. But I think what I love so much about that interview was just learning tons about your world and your move to Alaska, the story that you got there, how you got there to begin with is mind blowing, as well as uh, how you met your wife and all that, like you have some of the most fascinating stories ever. But on top of that, I think it kind of put everything in perspective. After that, it was like, whenever I felt like I was a little bit tired or needed more of a break or um, needed some extra motivation. I thought about you standing outside in negative 30 degree weather and thought, you know what, Robert can do this. We can do this. <laughs> For sure. Hey, as long as you have good gear, it's never too cold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which is uh, which is why I wear a Speedo everywhere. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but so so in addition to all the all the, you know, your typical day to day, week to week, 24 seven stuff you do in the in the dog mushing world. About two or three months after we recorded that interview, you and your wife, Michelle, actually bought Mushing Magazine. So congrats on that. We'll still call it hot off the press, but really, really cool getting into the magazine space and just further expands your uh, your mushing empire. Uh, can you share a little bit about like how this came up and how you decided to to get into this magazine world? Well, uh, the magazine has been around since 1988. It's really the publication for our sport and our industry. And a guy contacted me last June. He said, hey, are you interested in buying the magazine? I said, sure, why not? Uh, flew up to Nome, Alaska, pretty much in the middle of nowhere and sat down with him. And he said, you're the first choice for this purchase. And I said, why is that? He said, I have listened to every episode you've ever done of your podcast. So you wow. are an fit. So podcasting and print world uh still still is uh alive and well absolutely all, all all the peas no that's one of my favorite parts about podcasting is that when you're when you're listening to a show or watching a show but especially when you have that it creates that connection with the host where you feel even if you haven't met them in person you feel like you know them and right. you never know what that can turn into I, I what i always tell clients is that start a podcast and and you might end up buying a, a mushing magazine that's pretty much what I say. <laughs> That's what I say first off. It's conceivably possible. Uh, we have uh, published uh, two issues now, getting ready to do our third. So it is a long, long process to do a print magazine. But when you're the only guy in the space, I think it's important to keep it up. Oh, totally, totally. And you you carved out your niche or niche there. I, I'm I'm mad at myself because I made that joke so many times, and now it's included in episode 300. Here we go. How, how would you characterize like the print magazine space compared to everything you've been doing digitally? Well, the most important part of it, I think, is the history. So we have 200 issues in our catalog, which is probably 30 stories per issue. So we have a hell of a lot of content that we can republish and repurpose and all of that. And, uh, you know, that's what it's all about is being able to tell those stories to people that have never heard them before. Oh my God. So you, you're like, um, you're the king of like back catalogs and back catalogs. You got so many great stories there and audio form and print form and all of that. What's a, a tip that you've learned so far, uh, two, two issues plus deep of, curating so many awesome stories and doing it in like an efficient manner make sure the product's still awesome uh get out and meet people in all areas we've met graphics people and publishing people and printing people and everything it's just the connections you make are so important and you mentioned us meeting at podcast movement a year ago here i am on your podcast for the second time so hey relationships grow by meeting people in person i think that's very important still 
I think so. I, I think so as well. And actually, uh, you know, going forward after this episode, you've agreed to take over as host of the Wild Business Growth Podcast for every episode. So thank you for that. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, no, whenever. but you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So the, one of the other things that I loved about uh, your, your interview on this show going back was that you uh, and your wife have the tradition of doing the the rock and roller, a rock and roller coasters tour. And I just think that's the most awesome thing ever. First of all, it, I think you inspired me because I, I don't know what it was. I can't point to anything else except our conversation. Over the past calendar year, I've listened to and re-listened to more rock and more of my favorite rock bands um, right. th- than I have in any of recent years, probably going back since like high school or college. So it, it's I was long overdue of re-listening to... Oh my God. So I, I started with uh, Queens of the Stone Age and did the whole Palm Desert scene. And then I did the whole the grunge scene and all the Seattle bands and great ones there. And, you know, STP out of San Diego. Anyway, it, it's it's an amazing time just bounce around on Spotify. But anyway, you've probably seen most of those bands. So what what is the concert that you have upcoming up that either you have tickets for or just a band that you'd really love to see sometime in the next year? Well, uh, we are kicking off uh, the summer leg of the Rock and Roller Tour in just a couple of weeks. We're heading down to Portland, Oregon, and it starts with Foo Fighters there, traveling over to the East Coast, to D.C., to go to Podcast Movement and several roller coaster parks there in the nation's capital and ending up in Seattle to see Metallica for a two-day show there on Labor Day weekend. So two big heavy hitter concerts in the middle of our tour there. Oh, you're you're fighting the foo and you're metalling the Ica. So right. Right. Good, good good on you there. Uh, and then of course have to ask, what is the roller coaster that you are most excited to hit next? Well, we're going to the amusement park right outside of Washington, DC, called the uh, Six Flags America, I believe. I've never been there. I, I lived in DC when I was in high school, and that was before my roller coaster craze. So I'm excited to get out there. I I don't get out to the East Coast as much as I should. So it's time to check that one off the list. Perfect. Checking it off, rocking, you know, headbanging the the entire thing. You're you're probably, uh, you might be the only headbanger, I did a rod, potential racer combo. (laughs) Who knows? (laughs) Robert, thank you so much. It was a blast having you back on. Um, I know that if anybody wants to learn more about you, they can do so at Robert Forto on social media. Uh, And where's the best place if they want to check out Mushing Magazine? Mushing.com is the spot. I wanted The Onion to be available in every media possible. So we immediately moved into media that was available to us. The first one we moved into was radio super easy. We partnered with local radio station, started doing like a little onion news bit. And then we started producing it our, on our own and syndicating it to stations all over the country. I know Howard Stern played it for a long time. And that was a great way for us to build the onions aware, you know, awareness of the onion was to get that radio skit everywhere. It was super funny too. It was like, just like, the super square sounding AM news caster doing these really brief one minute onion things. And they sounded like real news, you know? And then we did a, um, the website, uh, well, we did a, I think we did a TV pilot first. We're trying to get on TV. Uh, we did a comedy CD and the internet was just like, one of our designers came to me and said, Hey, you know, we could, we could put this on the computer and people could type in an address and they would find the onion. And I was like, okay, let's do it. (laughs) And it cost us $400 to get the domain, theonion.com, because they were just $400 then. (laughs) My partner didn't want to spend the money, which is pretty funny. And then we did a book, and then we we started doing online video, we did a podcast, we did a movie, We, we did everything we could possibly do to get the word out. And it was always a matter of, rethinking what the onion was. We learned a lot of lessons from the TV pilots, those early pilots and the early comedy CDs. We learned that we got to do what people expect from us. We got to be in our voice and we have to totally change what we do to suit the rules of the new medium. You can't just take, for example, the newspaper and just put it on the radio. It's not going to work. You got, you have to make it sound like a radio show. Same with all the other media. Tamara, what, is your favorite song to sing to your dogs? 
I told you I make song <laughs> up. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Wait, wait, wait. So, th- so then, how how do you? So, can you give us an example? Like, how 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 do you make songs oh up like that? Oh my goodness, this is so embarrassing right now. I told you I'm the only one that knows that I can sing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't you, you don't you don't have to sing if you don't want of course if you do if you know if you do want you're welcome to it's called my doggies so it's my doggy <laughs> my doggies <laughs> and then it, it's like a whole thing go. after that it, if it's morning time i go into the morning about how it's a great day if it's the evening time i go into the evening about it, it's a song that i make up on the spur of the moment but i'm singing to them <laughs> I like it. It's, it's, it's got a ring to it. Beautiful. It, it, it's just so beautiful. All right. Next up, we have Liz Georgie coming back to talk about some acquisitions for Suna. We have the chief executive octopus of Gooder, Stephen Lease, in a snippet talking about the incredibly creative and energetic culture of Gooder. And then we have a false start that uh, any bat using echolocation or, or batman i would say would be proud of with david sowers of royal restrooms aka the toilet king all righty we are back but back 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 I try to say it different every time with a very special episode 300 of wild business growth special returning guest interview we have liz georgie of Suna, uh, the super cool co-founder and CEO and master of alliteration and S sounds, of course. But Liz, we had you on back in episode 276, which was right before Leap Day, actually, 2024. Uh, <laughs> how time flies. But yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for joining. How you been? How's your, how's your year been? My year has been really wonderful. We're having a great year here at Suna and I've really, you know, personally and professionally been making the most of 2024. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so leap days are in the air and you're taking leaps with your business. So we're going to see how corny we can get here. But <laughs> there um, you go. I was listening back to that interview as, as prep for this. And I think one of the things that really stood out to me about what you talked about that really inspired me was like, obviously you were very busy and like your team is very busy on the day to day. But one of the things that you were really focusing on at the time was like, what does the next generation of Suno look like? And like who, even if I stumble over my words when I say that, you know, (laughs) what what does it look like in the future? And like, what can we do to like make Suna better and better for our customers and add new features and products and things like that? And then sure enough, not too long after that interview, I found out that you actually made some acquisitions with your company. So there was Trend, the UGC aspect of that specialization and then mocker focus on ai which of course you've always had an interest focus in ai as well so first of all con- congrats on the acquisitions and in the growing suna umbrella if you will but um what what inspired you to to expand through the acquisition route the inspiration for ex- expansion through acquisition was really our own strategic planning process in 2023 we started looking at you know how was content changing and there was this question that kept coming up which is what do we think e-commerce and buying products is going to look like in the next five years? And everybody kind of around the table on my executive team kept thinking to each other or regurgitating sort of a version of this sentence, which is, well, actually we think that buying things on just the .com is maybe going to go away and people will continue to buy things across a much more distributed internet. And what I mean by that is when you think about you know, where do you buy your groceries now? Well, a lot of us are buying them on Instacart. Where do you buy some of your more frivolous purchases? A lot of us are buying them natively on TikTok. Where do you buy your gifts? Well, a lot of us are downloading apps that are gifting apps and we're buying through these other facilitators. And it's interesting because I think for a lot of years, the holy grail and direct to consumer was how do we just get people to go to our website? How do we get people to go to our website and buy things? And my business, Suna, we were in the business of let's make all the content that makes that website look great and make people want to buy products. But in the future, we thought, wow, you know, we think purchasing is actually going to change. We think the purchasing journey is much different than it's been over the last few years. 
And so it's fascinating because the chance that we had then was to say, well, okay, with that in mind, how does Suna need to change? If we believe e-commerce is going to change, how is Suna going to change? The discovery we had in that process was, well, Suna needs to become a much broader content company. We need to be experts in all types of content that sells your products online, not just the content that lands on your PDP or your product display page. Uh, that was what was the initial impetus. And when we started having that strategic vision of, okay, we're broadening Suna to be the content company company for all of commerce, it became immediately clear that we had some gaps in our product. And the, the first gap that we identified was user-generated content and being able to create videos and photos that go on places like Instagram or TikTok to get people excited to buy your product in those places. And so we started looking at some of the different user-generated content platforms and immediately found a true alignment with Trend. Trend had an ethos like we did, really believed in affordability, really believed in access and of course, quality. How do we make the best quality for the dollar that our brands are paying? And also we just thought that the team was really exceptional. And so made that acquisition uh, and are really excited to say it's been a very successful acquisition. Our customers are loving trend. And I think trend customers are really loving access to Suna. So that's been really positive. If you think about AI then, okay, well, how else is content changing in this sort of next generation of how we shop online? Well, one of the things that became clear to us was that personalization and optimization of images that you already have is going to be a really important part of expanding the value of your content, but also just iterating on it, making different versions, making different options so that different consumers have a different experience. And when we looked at the AI tools on the market, the one that we kept coming back to was Mocker. The reason we kept coming back to it is they just had a totally novel approach. So many of these companies are really focused on what I would call making net new images or reinventing images. But Mocker's approach was, no, we actually love your product image as it is. We want to retain that product image. We want your product to look its best, but we want AI to expand your optionality through AI editing. So being able to do things like add props and generate props with AI or add different scenes or settings and, and have AI generate those things. And that kind of expansion of creativity really resonated with us on the product side of the business. We thought, wow, you know, imagine this huge library. We have 20 million images in our SUNA databases that we've created with customers over the last five years. Imagine how much more optionality they're going to have by having an AI editor that really works with them in companion with their existing content. And so uh, that made the mocker acquisition just make a tremendous amount of sense for us. And, you know, uh, not to say we're done acquiring, we're still uh, thinking about acquisitions in the future, but I have to say these two first acquisitions have been a really big success for us. Yeah, well, congrats on that. The word is overused like crazy, but like the synergies and compliments there are. Uh, <laughs> I try really hard not to use that word synergy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so exactly. Well, I thought I'd throw it in there for you. Yeah. So <laughs> no, no, but it, it makes a lot of sense. And it's just a, a beautiful, natural growth and um, synergistic. No, I can't resist now. You got me going yeah. uh, of, of Suna. But kind of one piece of party advice here. What, what advice would you say for any fellow founder out there that wishes to go the acquisition route. I have such an interesting uh, point of view on this because I've sat both in the seat of the person selling their company. So I sold my first company in 2019. And now I've sat in the seat of someone who is helping shape the decision-making and ultimately acquiring companies. And what I can tell you is that I think so differently now about how I should have positioned my company for sale now that I've been on the acquisition side of the table. And what I can tell you is that there's really three things you should be thinking about. First, you really need to make sure that your business is in a place where it is uh, applicable to a larger industry or category. I think a lot of founders sometimes are trying to solve a very small problem because that's how you actually find product market fit. But when you're starting to think about selling your company, you've got to figure out, okay, I've got product market fit, but how does that expand? How does that grow? What are the cross-sell, upsell opportunities that might exist for an acquirer if they were able to apply our product to a new domain or a new industry? And if you can't articulate that, you're actually then requiring your you know, potential acquirers to imagine that. Don't make them work that hard. They're going to give you uh, bonus points. They're going to value you higher if you can help paint that picture for them. The second thing that I would say is, you know, be really conscientious about 
who is going to be required to make this acquisition successful on, on both sides of the table. And what I mean by that is I think sometimes when companies are selling their business, they'll say, oh, here's the, the primary team. You're going to need to run this business as it is today. And that's actually not why someone would buy your company. What they want to do is they want to buy your business and evolve it for their business. And so think about the people on your team, whether that's in engineering or in marketing or sales, who are the most adaptable, the most creative, and really the most capable of expanding their mindset so that if you sell your, your company to a new uh, acquirer, they're able to use those teammates to leverage their knowledge, leverage their background expertise, but then apply it in new and novel ways. And that's what's going to ultimately lead to a really successful acquisition for everyone involved. And I think critically, you know, it can be scary for employees to change hands, to go from, you know, a world that they knew and understood with their existing employees to a new world when they're acquired and actually involving them, making sure they understand the role that they play and how they should play that role can ensure that they feel more comfortable with that transition and just more excited about it overall. You want there to be excitement about that at the end of the day. And so those are the things that I would focus on if you're thinking about trying to sell your company someday. Well, synergy is the golden word. No, thank you so much, Liz. This has been fantastic. Um, so great catching up with you and congrats on all the growth and and, and the more and more new life into Suna. Uh, I know if somebody wants to connect with you, they can learn more at Suna.co. That's S-O-O-N-A dot C-O, as well as at Liz Georgie, G-I-O-R-G-I. And RG, I'm going to stop spelling things because I'm exhausted from it, as well as at your favorite bar in Dinky Town. So thanks so much, Liz. Oh, of course. And congratulations on 300 episodes. Thank you. Thank you. It means a ton. Can you share some of kind of like your guiding principles or like what, what makes good or unique from a, a culture sense that's allowed you to, to grow this way? Yeah. I mean, our two core values are fun and authenticity. And we define fun as celebrating the work over the results. And we define authenticity as liking who you are as part of this brand. And we have hundreds of actual supporting and slippery behaviors for each, right? So we're very explicit about what this means. They're, they're not just like bullshit words. And I think at the core, if you kind of unpack those two things, you need to love the work here. Good or we're not a party brand, we're a fun brand. And we think fun is celebrating the work over the results. And so Gooder is actually not an easy place to work. I think that if you like work, you like challenging, if you like solving hard problems, you like changing very, very quickly, it could be the best job you ever had in your life. But if you don't, you're going to be miserable here. And so I think that's important. You just have to love doing work, uh, be driven with patience. And then from an authenticity side, liking who you are as part of this brand, man, I don't want anybody ever to be, have the Sunday scaries or be miserable. I think it's okay to have five or 10% of your job. You can be annoyed by because you're like, well, this is just bullshit. I have to do That's fine. But I think anything over that I've done a talk about this recently with the company. I'm like, if 20% of your job you find miserable, you got to find a new job because that is one day a week you're miserable. That is that is not sustainable. And so I think if you those two things. Oh, Brady, we are here, here with, with – oh, wait. Sorry. Hold on. I'm hearing a little echo. Let me work that out first. <laughs> David Sowers, the number one man in the number two business, as he says. <laughs> All right, next we have a returning interview with Thomas Dambo, also of Denmark, who is the troll king. You see his trolls all around the world, and he's been up to just a few trolls since he was last on the podcast. We also have Cheryl McLean of McLean and Turquoise. <laughs> my voice might have just cracked there. Uh, one of my favorite business names to talk, say, Turquoise, talking about her day of inspiration uh, and creativity there. And then Nicole Zeno of Clever Cow Media with dad jokes on dad jokes, sure to make you raffle copter. All righty, we are back, but back, back, back with a very, very special guest for episode 300 of the Wild Business Growth Podcast, Thomas Dambo, the sculpture, uh, I butchered that, the sculptor and recycled artist who you've probably seen his giant troll creations all over the world. 
Thomas, so excited to have you back on. Uh, you were actually way back in episode 220 back in January 2023. So really cool to catch back up. And most importantly, the time of this recording, you just got married. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me back. It's uh, yeah, It's been a busy year. I'm sure you've been busy too. Yeah, no, I, I, I've just been sitting and admiring your trolls. So thank you. You're, uh, you're, you're working very hard, but uh, life moments as well as uh, professional moments as well. One of the things I want to catch up back with you on is the fact that you haven't exactly just been sitting around relaxing since we last spoke. You've been building more and more trolls, and I think the who we were chatting, trying to tally it up beforehand. I think it's over thirty trolls that you and team have built since we last spoke what's one of the projects that you were are like really really excited about how it turned out yeah it's been super busy i almost built two a month since we spoke together last year the best one always tends to be the the most recent one the most recent one i made was in france in a city called Rouen. and so it's like a troll hiding in this big forest and then it's kind of like sitting and taking care of it together with like kind of like a little hideaway city 30 small like makeshift uh, children houses in like that's like in a little circle i spent a lot of time going around and scrapping different things from scrap yards and the city signs and uh, the hood of a car and all different things and a lot of recycled wooden belts and like this and then we had like 20 kids that were like in a program for kids who had a little bit of like a, a rough time at home and then they helped us build all these small houses like into each other you know with like with a little city gate and a little tower and a little all different wonky funky houses like you know with all this the city signs and stuff like that as, as roofs and that was really really special because it's like a it just gives you that feeling like, what the heck is this when you find it? You know, like, because you feel like you found uh, the place Robin Hood is hiding out or where the books uh, live in Star Wars or something like that. It feels like that, you know, and then there's this giant troll that's sitting together with it. And it was just so nice. And the, all the kids, they just were so happy to to help build it, you know, and they're like, can this be a job? You know, does somebody have this as a job to just dumpster dive and build this weird stuff out in the forest? You know, for them it was just like a, a good moment. I think you're you're, you're opening doors for all generations. But uh, I, I think that's what, that's what's so brilliant about your creations is that that ability to like discover them and then the mystery about them. And I know you've been kind of hidden on the exact locations of a lot of them. Just, you know, going back to the original interview with you, like the amount of people that reached out and are like, hey, I know those trolls or I've seen them around the world or like I've seen them in Denmark or wherever. And, and since then, even like my um, cousin, shout out Alec and his wife, Casey, in uh, Indiana posted pictures from a troll in Indiana. And I'm, so I'm like, I'm sure growing up in Denmark, Indiana is like number one on your list for trolls. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's, it's amazing. Has anything changed about your process? Like now how you build trolls compared to the early days? Like the number one thing that's changed is that the process have went from everything being something that was dependent on me. So I had to be able to afford it. I had to be able to lift it. I had to be able to build it. I had to be able to crawl on top of it. Like, so everything was designed for my mind and my body. That's what birthed the project and made it so crazy because I'm a crazy individual that dares to do stuff like that, you know? Now, I can design it for other people who can build it, people who's actually better at uh, building than I am. Um, so that have made it so that now all of a sudden uh, that I have so many people who can help me, I can dream up even crazier stuff, you know? And it took me some time to to learn this, but now I'm like, let's build a troll that's like uh, standing on one lake on a giant boulder or like uh, let's buy 6,000 uh, rocks and then place them in a fairy tale loop around the hospital and then build 10 different sculptures that tells a story or like right now we just like i told my assistant like build a model of a caterpillar excavator in the scale as so it fits to my body as for a troll so we can take photos of me wrestling with the excavator so that then when we're going to build the troll wrestling excavator then we can have be inspired by this model uh, session we did with me 
And if you're just standing alone in your workshop, then you'll be super lazy and then you don't have the time to build all that stuff and like that. But to, to have such a big team and start yeah, starting to understand the power of that team and dare to use the team, uh, that has changed everything. So now it's uh, now I can just do really sick stuff and I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Well, speaking of things that start with T, like teamwork, uh, you, you've also since uh, launched the book Trash Trolls and Treasure Hunts. Uh, so shout out the alliteration there, but a really, really cool book. If you've seen anything about it online, you just know that it's part of the book. There are just beautiful, beautiful pictures of so many of your creations out there. How, how does it feel personally to have some of your creations now captured, not only online, but in actual print form as well? I think it's for for me it's the same feeling as when I I used to be a rapper, you know. So when I made my first CD, you know, it was like, and then the cover, and then of course I designed the cover also, you know, from there was a rap album, and then like a, the shout out to all the homeboys, and then I wanted that photo in it, and we need the perfect logo, and you know, like all of it because you know, like. Like, cause I remember when I got the first Public Enemy CD, and I would sit on the on the carpet in my teenage uh, room and listen to it on my big speakers, and you know, so then you grow up and then you make that CD yourself, and then you want it to be perfect for because it's that's the feeling of accomplishment, you know. And I remember going to the museum with my mom and looking in in these big uh, coffee table art books uh, with like different artists who would do different stuff and photographers and like that, you know. So, so to be able to make that book for myself self you know i really really i took the time to make it really nice because I, I made it for myself you know i didn't care if i would sell any i just i made it for my parents for my wife and for my crew and for myself that's who i made it for and so we would have it for uh, ourselves after that then i make it so i can put it on the table when i have a meeting with the next client boom there it is i made a hundred of these sculptures you know this is like the ultimate cloud that you can have a, as an artist it, it is to have accomplished it and, and done it you know so it's like it's also a ticket that you buy into for the next level of your career in some some sense right like now i have made that book so for a long time i was like working towards being able to make the book and for many years i wanted to make the book when i didn't have enough content to put in the book you know and then all of a sudden i got so so busy i wanted to make it when i had made 50 trolls but then i didn't have the time to do it and then it was like let's do it for 60 and 70 and 80 and 90 and then the, finally it got there when we made 100. <laughs> well thomas you are the ultimate troll in the best way uh, so thank you so much for all that you create and uh, i know if anybody wants to learn more or check out some pictures or find out where to find them. Uh, they can go to thomasdambo.com. You got links there to the book, your Instagram, YouTube, all those things. You know, if any listeners do go and actually stumble upon one of your trolls, what do you want them to do? Like, should they tag you in a picture? Should they send it to you? Like, what's the, what's your preferred way? Well, I would prefer if they could uh, make sure that if somebody have littered around the troll and please pick it up and then bring it to a trash can because a lot of my work is out in nature and not all humans they remember to not litter and a lot of us we also just lose stuff all out of our pocket when we take the phone or something like that you know so please just help cleaning up after everybody so the next people can also enjoy it have a good time uh, check out the sculpture and uh, go around and uh, see what else you can find in nature it's a great spot what things have you done on these the said day of inspiration that have got you most inspired and creative, creatively energized. <laughs> this is going to sound really corny, but when Beyonce came to town, I had the ability to, to be in the, the one of the suites and uh, with the Bow Collective, we had gotten a suite and everybody was there for Beyonce. And I wasn't, I was there because I was just about to jump into a project that's going to have some a little hip hop in it. I call it hip hop, which means I'm going to be dealing with a lot of color, a lot of current conversations. And when I was looking at Beyonce, of whom, you know, I'm no, no different than anybody else. I loved her. Was I looking at what she was wearing? Yes, but for a very different reason. You know, I'm looking at the colors. I'm looking at the mood. I'm looking at the people. I'm taking it in. Because whatever that energy is, is the energy I wanted to take with me into this other project. So that was one that was kind of unusual. You go to Beyonce concert, concert for inspiration, but that's what I did, you know. 
I have some done something as simply as go to the beach and take my journal and just sit out there and do nothing because I needed a blank space. I needed to just kind of free myself from all the craziness just to, to create some clarity about what is it that I'm going to do with this project. So it just, it, they're all different is the point I'm making. Why did the chicken go to the seance? Oh, God. I'm not even going to try. Go on. <laughs> to get to the other side. Oh. No. <laughs> that was the I reaction. Think, think... Why do I get that reaction? Why did the scarecrow get an award? Oh, I just made a scarecrow joke in my newsletter. Does it have something about hay or being stuffed? No, probably not. Go ahead. No, because he was outstanding in his field. Wow. <laughs> anyway, with that note. <laughs> um, if Bravo. You... <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Still some of the best and corniest and uh, musical to my ears dad jokes I've ever heard. All right, we are in the home stretch. We have first up Crystal Prophet, returning guest, where we're talking all things, uh, some things that I'm grateful for, but uh, a little bit of fun at the end of this interview as well. Uh, and I, I, I surprised her by throwing in um, a, a weird talent voice that she does. I, I don't even know how to describe it. After that, we have Joe Pelletieri, a fellow Hoosier, with the big mouth Billy Bass story. And finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, the medley of voice cracks. My <laughs> my prize moment from, from way too many interviews. Enjoy. Alrighty, we are... Ba, 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 back. I'm trying to set a record for a number of times I say back <laughs> with a very, very special uh, returning guest for episode 300 special of Wild Business Growth Podcast, Crystal Prophet. Real name, no gimmicks, uh, as Eminem says. But <laughs> Crystal, uh, so excited to have you back on. Crystal, for anybody who's not familiar, I don't know how, uh, is the content strategist, coach. Uh, <laughs> I, I, co that came out as like coast. Coat, coast, whatever. <laughs> uh, coach, and uh, well, I'll just call you multi, multi time podcast hosts. You've done, you know, thousands of episodes. But I was looking back, Crystal, and you were on it way back. Like you almost missed the, missed the cut for this. You were back in episode 203, and that wow. was in August of 2022. And, and now uh, you have 10 children. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I've added multiple F's and multiple more T's to my name. Yes, I've, I've made it all, all more complicated. <laughs> exactly. But what's what's new in your world? How's everything shaken since um, you know you you bared that terribly corny interview last time? Oh my gosh. Well, I have to say, as soon as you said, all righty, like Ace Ventura immediately popped into my head and I was just oh, yeah. like, oh, he's going with it like the old Jim Carrey shtick today. So this is so great. Yeah, I'm actually doing some really fun stuff behind the scenes because I haven't told you this. So this is like hot off the presses. Like this is the first time I'm putting it out into the universe, but I am developing a brand new tool, a brand new piece of software for creators. And we are in the very, very early stages, very or like barely have a name for this. And I'm so excited. My husband and I are doing this together and I, I just so much more to come. I can't wait. So like the next one, we can't wait for the next 100 episodes, but we'll have to like <laughs> share some updates because I think it's going to be something fun for creators to use in their business to help them track their metrics a lot easier. Perfect. Well, congrats on that. And I, I think we could just name it right now. We'll just call it Ace Ventura to stick with yes. the, the vibes. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. That's, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I do that at the start of every interview and now I fully should be sued by, uh, Jim Carrey. In yeah. Ventura, so, or, or I just, uh, call me the pet whisperer, but, oh um, so that's really cool. Congrats on that. One of, one of the big reasons I want to invite you back on as, um, just, to, just to thank you again, because, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, but I think a lot of people don't know, you know, one of the biggest like personal or professional milestones that, that I, 
checked off over the course of the past 100 episodes of this podcast, you know, the time that aligns with that was speaking at podcast movement. And, you know, it's my favorite podcast conference. It's absolute blast for anybody who's ever been or aspires to, to learn more in the podcasting space. And so speaking in Denver, like it just, the session went awesome and the feedback was amazing. And I, I reached out to, to a few people, awesome people, and you were one of those leading up to it just for some advice from people I know had spoken at podcast movement before. And I was thinking like, maybe you'd give me like a tip or two. You're like, Hey, let's schedule a zoom. We talked for like 30 or 40 minutes. You gave me this whole framework (laughs) of like how to structure a presentation, how to prepare for it and everything. So I, so I have to just thank you again for that because it it went awesome. But on top of that, I, I, I think, or within that underneath that, I think one of the, the biggest things that I took away from talking with you is that, Hey, like, you know, there's two ways to go about things. You can try to memorize it, or you can just practice and practice until you really know it. And it kind of comes from the heart and naturally. And I I went the latter route. And you also gave me the advice, like leading up to your, you're like, this is the best speech I ever did. And I practiced it 12 days in a row leading up to it. So I'm like, all right, perfect. I'm going to do the same. I rehearsed mine 12 days in a row. And when you do something 12 plus times, you really do know the content. So that that's just what I what what I took away from that. So that's that's gold advice there from Crystal Profit. <laughs> well, and I mean it, it does a few things. Like it actually, like you are so sick of it also by the time you're just like, oh my gosh, let me just get on stage and do this thing, right? Like you're so you're not in your head about it. If you practice it once and you don't like you're just reading it off of a script or your outline and you're like, you're kind of mouthing the words to yourself, like Yeah, that's one thing. And you can absolutely do that if you're a really, really good speaker right off the cuff, but I need all the help that I can get. And I need all the practice and in doing it that many days in a row, you get all those weird things that you may like word flub and say stupidly. And like you say it by yourself in your office or, you know, at your kitchen table, instead of front of hundreds of people and you just feel a lot more confident about it. So yeah, that's actually, I'm so proud of you, Max. And I actually, I want to take a step back because you did something that helped yourself in this whole process. And you asked for help. Like, I think anybody listening, like that's step number one is reach out to people because I know there's more people just like me that are out there that want to say, yes, like, let me show you what I did, or here's how this helped me, whether it is a framework or a process or whatever, but ask for help. I know it's not always easy, but man, it really pays off when you ask the right people. Thank you. No, that means a ton. And uh, I, I think for, for anybody who, who wants my advice now, I think my best advice is to, you know, when you're on stage and for example, not specifically me, but if you're referencing uh, your wife, Dana, who is taking pictures and video of you uh, throughout the session, if you keep referencing her, everybody in the audience will turn and look at her every time you say her name. So that's something I learned. <laughs> so, <laughs> so very, very, very relevant. But um, it, no, it's, it's always funny how the, how the audience react. You never know what people are going to laugh to and what they're going to roll their eyes to or, or when they're going to look at your wife. So there we go. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Crystal, when I, when I think about you and your interview, uh, I, I look back and I think you have some of the best fun facts of all time and you (laughs) that comes from your experience podcast hosting podcast guesting but you have it packaged really nicely on your website where like if anybody's doing research on you there's like some really cool fun facts about your background so we talked about that back in you know when i interviewed you but in the spirit of that i want to wrap up this mini interview with two truths and a lie and this isn't about you this is about me so i'm putting you on the hot seat you ready for it okay All right, so I'm going to read off two truths and a lie, and then you're going to have to guess which one is the lie. And I'm not going to tell you just because that's how it works. I don't know why I even added that in. All right, so first one is I got a tooth knocked out while playing basketball in high school. So that's the first one. Second one is I'm named after a pro athlete. And third one is... I have a bullet wound. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So basketball tooth, pro athlete, basketball bullet tooth. wound. That just sounds like, <laughs> sounds like a kid's That's movie. Like basketball a, tooth. It's SpongeBob's tooth. friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, so I think that the first one could easily be true. I think that that one's true. 
I think that the bullet wound just feels so out of left field, but it's also like, okay, this is, this was an accident and it happened and it's true, but I'm going to go with the first two are true. And the last one's a lie. Wow. You are incorrect. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> very close. Yeah. You, you got one of them, right? So here's, here's the background from each of them named after a pro athlete. That is true. And that's, it's kind of an asterisk because my middle name is Aaron and my dad's favorite baseball player was Hank Aaron. So okay. that's where the Aaron comes from. So it's middle name, but that I'm, I'm concerning that true. The bullet wound you guessed was false, but it's technically true because shout out my good family friend, mentor Howard, when I did like senior project with him in, in high school, uh, just for like a, a fun thing after, like, uh, he took me to a shooting range and towards the end of it, while I, I was shooting at the target, a bullet shell flew out of like, it flew out of the gun and bounced off the side barrier and then bounced back at me and got like wedged temporarily in between my protective glasses and my, oh my, gosh. my forehead. And it stayed there. And I like, this is not safe at all, but I literally like dropped, I put the gun down cause it was so hot that I, like I, I freaked out and I don't know. You probably have to look really close to see if there's actually a scar there these days, but I like to tell people I got a bullet one. So that's, so that's that. So I'm bending the rules for all this here. So both, so both there's those like are asterisks true. And like <laughs> yeah. all kinds of like parentheses and like, maybe like the, exactly. That's so, yeah, yeah that's so and interesting the, though. The last one. So this is crazy getting a tooth knocked out by an elbow playing basketball. So I was actually on the flip side of this. We were playing basketball freshman year of high school in gym class. And I went up for a rebound and accidentally elbowed my friend Adam Rosenberg in the mouth and like it knocked his teeth back and it was it was a whole thing his teeth he got it repaired it was it was like totally fine after but I felt so bad for the longest time so that one was true but in the opposite sense so that's the oh, false one here man. So. yeah Adam's like you know still shaking his fist at you like that Max <laughs> <laughs> exactly so so thank you for bearing with that 10 minute explanation but but you did great Crystal this is just such a blast catching up big fan of you obviously if we haven't talked about it enough and, and all you're doing and congrats and everything else uh new coming but um I I know if anybody wants to learn more, they can learn more at crystalprofit.com. And just for fun, can you spell profit for us one more time? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's crystal with a K and then profit has two F's and two T's. And Max, I am so excited for you. Congrats on 300 episodes. Like what an accomplishment. I hope you find a really fun way to celebrate with your wife, like do, do something crazy because I mean, it's, it really is an accomplishment. So congrats. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to go play basketball and uh, watch a major <laughs> league baseball. So there we go. All right. Thank you, Crystal. What is a, a weird talent or party trick you have that doesn't impact your business, but you're just really good at? Oh, I can talk with my mouth closed. I sound, I can say, <laughs> and it's really creepy. And my husband's like, please don't do that. <laughs> but if I will scream help me get me out of here get me out of here because it sounds like i swallowed a little girl and she's screaming and it makes me think of like poltergeist back in the day like carol ann would scream out of the tv we're getting really dark this took a turn max i wasn't prepared for this today yeah, yeah. it typically does with rapid fire <laughs> I, don't, I don't think i could do it without laughing okay <sighs> okay <laughs> oh my god that's insane wow that i'm glad it's, i asked oh my gosh you can say no but please let me keep that in for for multiple episodes that's totally <laughs> fine no one saw it i i covered my face i hope that's your new sting that you use on all of your episodes <laughs> Okay, so when I when I when I went to Jimmy, I was my title was like director of retail development or some BS title. I mean, I just wanted to get in the door and make toys. You know, that's that was my goal. You know, so when I went there, I would uh, you know someone left, like the person who did the music left. I said, I'll do that. The licensed person, I'll do that. And I started doing everything, and I was involved in all the uh, the product development meetings. 
And I remember one time I sent uh, an email with like 10 items, you know, just 10 different ideas. And I still have that email because if I look back on it, it's like seven of those items became big hits for us. It was like the first 10 ideas I threw out there. And so I started working on them. And number seven on that list was Big Mouth Billy Bass. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't my initial idea. My wife and I were driving, we saw Bass Pro and we were thinking, uh, you know, brainstorming, you know, what can we do? What kind of items can we do? She goes, well, how about a fish on a plaque singing? And I thought, well, that's, that's a good idea. So I kind of put it down. It became one of those 10 items. It's just, it took about like a year to get that thing done. I mean, it was, it was, it was horrible. It was like a clown fish. It just wiggled on the plaque. I mean, it, it, we probably would have sold some, but it would have been horrible. So I, I, I just, I, I just, I, there's something there. And so I remember I was in, um, in Hong Kong, like I would go a week before all the salespeople go, me and the creative director, and we would, uh, like set up the showroom. I would, I would, my part, I would go into China and work, get, make sure all the products get out of China into Hong Kong. And he would set them up in the Hong Kong showroom. Well, my last day I went to the Hong Kong showroom and I, it, I saw the fish for the first time done. I mean, it just took, it took a year and it just, it was very slow and no one wanted to do it. And it was up on the wall, put up on the wall. I looked at it for like 10 minutes and then I just took it down off the wall. I took a train back into China. I was going back home the next day. So I had to get back to Hong Kong and everything. But I just said, can you make the head turn? And uh, and that's that's that kind of did it. And uh, once once the head turned, it became an item. I mean, that, the people just it took them by so much by surprise. And that was that was the hook and it was that head turning. Yes, Razor as in Razor Scooter. Yet, <laughs> objects or foods or drinks that could, you know, come in handy when you're out of the water, out of the, oh, nice little voice crack there, out on the water or like, alrighty, we are here with Justin Kittred, <laughs> who my voice cracks saying your name, so sorry, Justin. Let me say it again. <laughs> this is why I edit. <clears throat> too, too early to be talking, right? No. Until next time. Let your business ru- Whoa. Zoinks. <laughs> thank you. Well, before I say thank you, you're welcome for the voice cracks, but thank you so much to all you wild listeners out there, to all you wild entrepreneurs, wild guests, alums out there, current, past, future, everything. You, you all make this show possible, and I'm seriously pinching myself in the most wild way that episode 300 it's here it's almost over actually but episode 300 seriously pinch my moment so grateful for everything and super excited for 301 and 302 at that and uh yeah a few more as well if you love the wild business growth podcast make sure if you're not already that you are subscribed or, or follow the wild business growth podcast on your favorite podcast platform it's usually a button that says follow you can you can click it some platforms it says subscribe speaking of that for the video versions which again is a newer development over the past 100 episodes you can subscribe on youtube that youtube channel is at Max Branstetter. So make sure to hit the subscribe button there and you will be seeing more and more video versions of these awesome interviews that uh, that still give me chills and, and, and still make me cringe. Mo- mostly myself, I'm cringing. Like, like right now, it would, it would be a cringeable moment. For any help with podcast production, you can learn more at maxpodcasting.com. And for the newsletter that you are sure to like if you like this podcast, the Podcasting to the Max newsletter. It is where podcasting meets entrepreneurship meets the worst puns known to humans. And the sad part is I, I still think they're pretty good. <laughs> to sign up for the Podcasting to the Max newsletter, you can sign up at maxpodcasting.com slash newsletter. Until next time. <laughs> I'm laughing because Dana is trying to not make any noise in the background. <laughs> Until next time, thanks again, and let your business ruin wild. Bring on the bongos! Yeah.